That's you. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Robert Barrow. Most of you guys probably know me by now, but I saved the video. Um, so, when I'm, uh, come on. I don't want the big search engine. I want to talk about my thing. Uh, I created the thing, and I want to share it with you guys. Uh, Who here is familiar with Bootstrap CSS framework? Decent number of people. Those who are not familiar with Bootstrap, Bootstrap is basically a quick way to get your styling off the ground. They give you consistent button styles. They give you like tab strips, all kinds of stuff like that. And one of the things they're most well known for is their grid system. They give you the ability to subdivide a page into, say, three columns, four columns, 12 columns, you know, whatever and it is responsive, so you can make it uh, three columns on a really wide screen, two columns on a tablet, and one column on mobile. It's great. Now, how many people here have heard of Flexbox? Fewer people. That's okay. Flexbox is this idea that, um, one, one thing that we found that's really hard is stretching things down a page. We can control the width of things on a page fairly well um, and, and center them and do all kinds of cool stuff there. But when it comes to doing heights, we seem to have problems. It's really hard to get something that only has a little bit of content to shove its way uh, open to a whole page. There's a thing known as the holy grail layout, which is a header, three columns that are all stuck full height, and then a footer. It's like this, this thing that just is almost impossible to solve. Plenty of people have tried different ways of doing it, involving like, we're going to shift it all to the left and then start pulling things back to the right, like all kinds of weird stuff. But people have struggled to accomplish doing that. So Flexbox is an answer to that. Flexbox allows you to say, these three things are in a row, and I want them all to be the same height, and it does it. That's the beauty of, of Flexbox. The problem is, what if I want a grid of things that, like Bootstrap's grid, a grid of things that can then you know, be responsive and, and do what Bootstrap Grid does, but I want them to act like flex boxes. Turns out they don't work together. Well, I made Flexstrap. Flexstrap is a library that allows you to use flex boxes in a Bootstrap Grid using the existing Bootstrap Grid classes, and then you add some flex box classes on some, some custom flex box classes that I made, and magic happens. It's really cool. So. Um, this is the first version, it may be buggy, um, you guys are welcome to check it out, it's at github.com slash azurelogic slash flexstrap. Um, I've got two examples to go with it. First is how it plays with bootstrap grids, and then we'll talk about some of the nesting of uh, flex boxes. So what you'll see here is, notice when I get to a smaller resolution, we get two columns. And once we get past a certain point, we get something a little different. <laughs> Just to prove that it... Is that well, supposed to be a flag? No, <laughs> but I realized it ended up looking very, very American-esque. Um, the idea was I wanted to prove out even, you know, you could visit this and see even on mobile or you know, if you want to go here on an iPad, this still works. Turns out that the, the default widths set by Bootstrap don't quite play nicely in the uh, iOS rendering engine, so I had to tweak some of the internals a little bit um, of how Bootstrap works. We're talking like sub-pixel differences, but it, it ended up being important. Um, so what this does is you can see that we end up with a four, a four width followed by an eight width in, because remember Bootstrap's grids add up to 12. So we have a four followed by an eight, another four followed by an eight, now, if we did this wrong without Flexbox, I'm going to strip Flexbox out of this, and you'll see what happens. Um, we're just going to take that out. The whole grid collapses. Because what's actually happening here is this sets the height here. And all what, what's happening in, in Bootstrap is it's all about a bunch of floats. So this is floating left, this is floating left, and because this blue does not fill up the whole height, the red one slips in, and your grid collapses. This is a huge problem for creating like a nice calendar layout, or what I was trying to do was, uh, I had a system that was for doing graphs. I was, I was displaying 
uh, like visualizations in a, in a grid to users. Well, I wanted to build a way for them to customize those graphs, but the custom that UI didn't actually show them graphs. It showed them icons of graphs and stuff like that. Well, I couldn't get the heights of those. You know, when I had these rows, they didn't all do nice heights. And I wanted nice heights where they all were equal. So I came up with this idea. I was like, well, our target browsers were modern browsers. I was like, I have Flexbox. Maybe I can make Flexbox work. And that's how I started working on this. So as soon as I put Flexstrap back in, Bam. Grid behaves because what's actually happening here is in this first row, it's creating a row, a, a, a flex box row, and the blue one, there's actually a div around it that's being forced open to this full height to match the height of the row. And so the reason I did this was to was partly to test that it works for all sorts of different uh, widths of bootstrap. Uh, components. So I went all the way up to eight. I believe that if it, if it works up to eight, it should work for the ones above that because the percentages are very similar. Um, so the other one that I wanted to show you guys is some of that holy grail type layout stuff. Is that what I have here is a flex box row, and then inside of this one, I then made a flex box column. And so I can, once you get inside of a flex box, it's kind of like an abyss. You cannot come back out and start doing some of the normal positioning things, certain things that normally work in CSS to, to do like a position relative and then snap something to the bottom of a, of a space, just fail. Um, so I learned this the hard way, that's how I got to, I, I tried doing this and failed and that's how I got to here. One minute. So that's why I did this. Basically the idea is you could build a grid and then each of those items in the grid can have flex boxes inside. So this Expanded middle actually takes up all of this space, which is why bottom is being forced down. You can see we've got a flex row, and then we've got a flex collapse, which causes it to collapse in. And both of these are collapsed in in the row. And then we have a flex collapse on top and bottom, and a flex expand in the middle that forces them out. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's just a simple set of classes. I'm going to be putting some documentation into the README, uh, publish it on NPM, as well as Bower. Uh, it's the first kind of framework-y kind of library thing I've ever done. So, uh, But I thought you know, there's, there's got to be other people having these kinds of layout issues. So I created it, put it out there, and you guys are the first people that have gotten to really see it. So that's it. Um, I don't know if anyone has uh, heard of it. It's Ansible. So, people have heard of uh, Puppet, Chef, you guys heard of those tools? So this is in the same line of tools as those. So, it is a way of automating uh, how you set up uh, a computer. So say you spin up an EC2 or a digital ocean, and then you can use Ansible then to define it. You define it with YAML, and so unlike, say, Puppet or Chef, where you have to install, like, say, Ruby or a client. This actually uses SSH. So you install nothing on the server side. So on the client, you install it with Python. It's just a Python app. So you just do pip install Ansible, and then you have it. Then you define uh, roles and things to do. So you say you go in, say, create this user. And it's also idipotent, meaning you can run it multiple times against the same server and you'll always get the same output out. So if that user exists, it won't create another one. Um, if there's a file, it'll even check to see if it's the same, uh, you know, all the text is the same. If it isn't, it'll update that file. And then you can do things like roles. So you can kind of see there where it says common. So you can set up a common and go in and set up like a firewall, make sure you have certain users created, um, you know, make sure certain keys are on your uh, server in the cloud. And then you can do Apache, and then you can say, okay, make sure Apache is set up. And it'll go through. And then you also can use things, uh, it has templating as well. So you can use variables, you can set things up. So it is very, very flexible. Um, let me see if I can find a... Uh,
So you also have uh, inventories. So you can set it up and say, I want these 10 servers to have these roles applied to it. And this can also be uh, queried out. So if you have, say, AWS, they have a little Python script. You just give it your uh, <coughs> keys and stuff to get in. It'll go in, query out all your EC2. You can go by tags and say, I only want your EC2 instances tagged with this and then apply these roles to them. So it is pretty much anything you think that you could do, you can do in Ansible. So uh, here's a nice example. Uh, again, like I said, um, I, I pretty much am doing this on the fly. <laughs> so it's YAML, so you just define it. So right there um, is a variable, so you can set it up, yum. The one downside is, is that it is tied. So if you have, um, you know, like a Red Hat based one, you'll do yum. If you have a Debian based, you'll be doing uh, apt uh, install. So although I find that's not too much of an <coughs> issue, because usually you're not having a vast array of different type of distros that you're deploying to. You have a set. You're running like Ubuntu 14.4 LTS. You don't then have this random Red Hat that then you have to worry about, well, how do I install a package? Um, but still, you can go in, so you say uh, name, uh, for example, so you could put this in a for loop of a bunch of items and say make sure these are all installed. Um, so here's an exa a perfect example. So it'll make sure app server's installed uh, and then Acme software's installed. Uh, here's a template. So you can set up files locally and then pop it in and then you can just go in and use that template. Um, and that has all sorts of, uh, it uses Jinja too. I don't know if you guys know that, if you know Python as a templating language. So you have, you know, if breaks, you have for loops, you have variable uh, substitution. So pretty much anything that you can think to do in a template, uh, you can do. So um, there's a bunch of modules um, uh, built into here. Uh, for example, uh, let's see here. I'll just search for um, Ansible app module, and it should take it to the documents. Everything's well documented. So here, for example, you want to install something with apt. It comes in. So here's all the options you can use, uh, what you can put into them. And then so here's some examples. So if you're doing name, you can even tie it to specific versions. If you only want, uh, like right there, name foo 1.0, stay present. You can update the cache to make sure you're getting the newest one uh, before. So you can completely configure how each step runs. And again, like I said, because it's idipotent, you can just create these and then just push them against all your servers to set up exactly what you need. Um, so this is great for setting up a server. And then let's say you have an app deployed. So you have some Git, GitHub code. You can pull it down. You can make sure um, everything's set up. Um, if you're playing around with Docker and stuff, you can set up Docker. Uh, you can set up your containers exactly how you need them. So anytime you need to set up a uh, server, um, Ansible is a great way. Uh, that's about it. We are familiar with RSA encryption. A couple people? Okay. So RSA encryption is pretty much the backbone of the type of encryption we use to log into services and things online. When you're logging into Google, you're using RSA. But RSA isn't used to encrypt like books and other large documents. And that's because it's a little slower because the keys for RSA are typically over 2,000 bits. In fact, nowadays you can have like 4,000 bit RSA encryption keys. And RSA is also special because, what's the mouse for It's also special because it uses two keys. You have a private key and a public key. If you encrypt with your private key, you have to decrypt, the message can only be decrypted with the public key. You can't encrypt and decrypt with the same key. So this is a very unique, and it's a mathematical property that does this. So uh, let's go work. Ah, it's already in here. So I don't want to go through the entire algorithm of generating a private and public key, because that would probably take a little bit. But, <laughs> So if we have a private key, and we're gonna, and it's gonna take two numbers. So I, I have already one pre-generated here, so we can do this real quickly. 
but love a private key of 13 and 55. Now, your actual private public keys will be much larger than that. They'll be gigantic for the kind of stuff we're doing. And I'll make my public key 37. So, if you have, seize your ciphertext. This is what you want to get. You want to encrypt something. So you need to take your message, raise it to E, which is this part of your private key, or it could be this part, doesn't matter. Just pick one, and then mod it by N, which is this. So in my little example here, Let's say we're going to do something real basic. Let's say our message is the number 8. And that's it. So I take the number 8 and I raise it to my E, 13, then mod it by 55. So it's going to say our result's 28. So our C, our ciphertext, is 28. That's our encrypted message. If I want to decrypt that, I can't use the private key. So real, I used, real quick, the sure. C, the, your 28, that's what's being passed from your machine to someone else's machine at that point. That's Essentially, yeah, you've encrypted it, and now you're sending that as the encrypted message. So well, that's my encrypted message, the number 28. To decrypt it, I now have to use the public key. And it's very similar. You take, let's see, oops. Oh, yeah, actually, this one. You take your ciphertext, the 28, you raise it to this, which is, the decryption key, or whatever you want to call it, but this is going to be D, and the N, mod 65. So if I do that, I'll take this 28, raise to 37, and you get the number 8. And that's how RSA encryption works. It uses Rather than using old ciphers or symmetric ciphers that we're used to, like Caesar cipher, where they're doing, you know, you take the letter A and you shift it three, so it becomes the letter, you know, D or E, or, you know, where you shift it. Instead, it's using this mathematical pr principles to do this adjustment. And so this is essentially the cornerstone of all our encryption for logging in and things like that to Google and Facebook or whatever services you use but it's impractical for encrypting large documents. It would be far too slow. Our symmetric ciphers are much faster. If, we're, if a document took a few minutes in a symmetric cipher, it would probably take hours for our say. And it's actually why when you sign in to Google or something, there's a few seconds delay. But our passwords are only, what, maybe 16 characters? If you're feeling you know, really adventurous, maybe 20, <laughs> 20 plus. So it doesn't take long for our say to encrypt something that small. So that's just a, a little overview of how RSA works. That's it. Yeah. So sure. 55, the, the, at your N, mm -hmm. does that have to be the same for the private and public? Yes, it is going to be the same for private and public. And there's a, there is a formula for generating this number. It involves using, so you select two large prime numbers, not the same, and then you have to calculate the totient of those numbers and there's a few other steps, but it's basically all based in math versus some, you know, trickery like yeah. mini symmetric key. So, so the public key is a um, a function of the private key, then? Or mm -hmm. okay. they're very they're they're related, and so they're both both important. You can't if you lose one key, you can't you essentially can't use the pair. You need both keys in a pair to make it useful. Someone you'll give someone your public key, and if you encrypt with your private key and send them a message. They have your public key and they can decrypt your message. But do you, can you only get a public key from a private key or do you create them independently? So they're created as part of a pair okay. when you do the mathematical process. And actually I can, I can show you guys kind of what they, uh, a typical, a typical key might look like. So, so in most cases, you would distribute your public key so people have access to it. And so when you encrypt something and send it to them, they can use your public key to decrypt it. So, so here's a list of a bunch of people's public keys, and here's one from an assignment 
I've done for security. And this is a public key. And these keys, this particular key is 3,072 bits. It's gigantic. So this is the key you would need to decrypt a message if I, that I sent with its, with its paired uh, private key. So yeah. Well, but the important thing also is that you can't, if, if I understood it correctly, you can't compute the private key from the public key or vice versa. Yes. Which is one of the things that makes this challenging, why it's, why it's still considered secure today. Well, then there's something interesting with that, that actually a key that was under 800 bits was like 700 some bits was broken. The encryption was broken. It took two years. It was done in like 2009. And so generally right now RSA keys are over 2,000 bits. We, we select, and as computers get better, the keys will just have to get bigger. And that's the way RSA yeah, keys even, are. Even 1024 has been considered. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I mean, from what I've heard. Oh, yeah, yeah. 1024 is like, eh, maybe you should it's stay away from that. It's too close. Yeah, it's just a little too close. The NSA is at least probably broken, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm Blake Robertson. Hi, Blake. Hey, so, uh, this is just a, it's not quite as interesting, but I thought it was pretty cool. Something practical I learned last week. We had some training at work. Uh, I had some guy come in and uh, run through a whole lot of different kind of web development related stuff, MVC, JavaScript, whatever. Um, and so one of those things that we, we talked about was jQuery. I'm, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with jQuery. Is anybody not familiar with jQuery? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So uh, I knew jQuery, right? Like all of us at work know jQuery. We use it all the time, whatever. Uh, and so he wanted to talk to us about like, how are you using jQuery? And uh, so of course we all know, you know, you can uh, select something on your, on your DOM using, uh, you know, ID of some sort, right? And that'll get you the element and, and you can continue to do all kinds of awesome jQuery magic, whatever. Um, and, you know, I'm sure all of us totally realize that you can also select like classes, right? Um, or whatever. Uh, so I knew all that, but, you know, in the past I'd always sort of wondered like, sometimes obviously it's useful to select something on class, especially if you need like multiple things, there's more than one. But if there's only one of them on the page and you just need to do like a one-off thing with it, uh, you know, my inclination generally was, you know, I'll just grab it with the ID and do whatever I need to do with it. Um, so his suggestion was that that is uh, evil, as he put it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he insisted you never want to do DOM manipulation with jQuery, which totally makes sense. But uh, like our issue was that in our pages, um, for a lot of our pages, we would uh, put some JavaScript at the bottom that then you know sort of initializes things, and then that JavaScript runs uh, to handle all, a lot of the interactions on the page. And um, you know each page is kind of different from the other ones you're using, so we'd always kind of do it just like a one-off thing. Like on on this page, you know, we'll write up whatever JavaScript needs to handle. The interactions on that page. On the next page, okay, we'll just kind of start fresh, maybe copy paste a couple things that seem useful, whatever. But you know, this page is going to have its own IDs, this page has its IDs, and, and whatever. So <clears throat> the example that we're going to go with is uh, say you've got a button and uh, that we're and uh, you've got a div, and uh, the div is uh, got a class on it called hide that you know just makes it display none. And uh, basically, what we want is for a button when you click it to toggle the visibility on this this class, right? So um, or on this div, I'm sorry. So you know maybe the div has uh, I don't know, something you don't always want to see, right? Maybe just let the user make it visible when they need it. So the way we would have done this before, or most of us were doing it before, was to say, you know, give our button uh, an ID of, you know, the button or something, 
And, uh, and then in our JavaScript, we'd say, okay, get me the button. And this is a specific button on the page. Um, and then, uh, you know, say, uh, on the click event, then um, we'll, uh, you know, run a function. And that function's going to then uh, get a div. So our div's got to have an ID, right? Um, so that's the div. And uh, then we got to do, you know, the div, and uh, then we'll say, you know, maybe toggle class uh, hide, right? Um, so that's great. It's not that hard. It works. Uh, but his point was, now we're tied to these IDs, this, this div. Both of those have to be on the page for this to work. And uh, it's, it's not very reusable, right? Um, and ultimately, if I wrote this out for real, like it's, I don't know, seven lines of code, maybe, something like that. Not a lot. It's pretty easy. But it could be less. As he put it, the best JavaScript is no JavaScript. <laughs> so if we can get that from seven to, say, two, that would be a lot better, right? So uh, instead of putting an ID on this button, or an ID on this div. Um, here's what he had suggested, um, which to me was like, oh, yeah, obviously, that is way better. <laughs> so for our button, we're going to put a class, which is, um, let's see, we're going to call this uh, maybe jQuery, JQ toggle. And then what we're going to put is actually a, an attribute, because jQuery can actually select attributes, which I always sort of knew, had occasionally used, but not really used a whole lot, right? Um, but we're going to say, uh, make up our own attribute, data uh, target, right? And we're going to set that to be, um, well, actually, we still need an ID here. All right, so this one's got to be an ID, but now it doesn't matter what the ID is. We're going to use the ID right here in our markup in the HTML, but our JavaScript doesn't need to know anything about it. So the JavaScript won't be tied to our HTML here. So we'll give this ID uh, the button. Or, uh, ha, that's a div. <laughs> yeah. So here we say the div. And we could actually put the hashtag here. We could even just pass this string into jQuery as a selector and it'll use it. So we could use an ID or we could use the class here even if we wanted it. If we had some other class on this that you know, was going to select it, that might make sense too. And then in our code, uh, instead of doing all of this, we say um, select on our class dot jq toggle and say get anything that has that class, and when it's clicked, then we'll get uh, whatever the attribute selector is. It's a little bit weird, right? Um, but get this attribute, and uh, then we'll say um, select whatever that attribute's for. That'll get us this div automatically, and then we'll just say toggle class on that, right? And so the benefit of that is, uh, so the benefit of that is now our JavaScript is completely separate from this. And now in any page that we want to do something like a toggle like this, all we have to do is put this class on here, put the data target attribute, and include a, a whatever script controls. <laughs>